Welcome everybody to Generation Analog Day 2. We are starting panel four, remediation and aesthetics. Um, I'm your moderator for this today's panel. Um, my name is Shelley Jones. Uh, I'm a professor of English at SUNY Delhi uh, here in the Catskills. Um, and we're going to just go ahead and get started. So our first panelist is Greg Loring Albright from Drexel University presenting his talk, The Sh Game Shapes the Virtual Space. So Greg, whenever you are ready to go ahead and share, please feel free. Sounds good. I am in slideshow mode and I will start my timer. Um, thank you for the introduction, Shelley. And actually, since uh, submitting my uh, proposal, I have uh, moved on. I graduated from Drexel and I'm now at Harrisburg University of Science and Technology. So uh, I'm in the, the hinterlands of central Pennsylvania. Uh, it's beautiful and I go hiking all the time. Uh, so um, this is my talk, Game Shapes the Virtual Space. I'm drawing on some empirical research that I did for my dissertation and uh, I, will, I will present that to you here. So I'll talk a little bit about the methods I used in the dissertation that were also used to capture this data that I'm talking about today. I'll give you a little bit of the theory that I'm using. The bulk of the presentation will be the presentation of two sort of comparative case studies, and then I will conclude. So uh, I watched people play games for my dissertation. It was great. Um, I initially proposed that I would uh, watch people just play games in person, like in this image here from PAX Unplugged 2021. But then of course the pandemic happened while I was busy proposing. And so my dissertation research was a split between in-person observations and online observations. And today I'm gonna to talk about two online observations. Um, in addition to those direct session uh, reports, I, I sat in on game sessions in person and online. I also invited every player to do an interview with me and I averaged around one interview per session. Um, so that gave me some sort of back-end insight into what was going on in the players' minds while they were playing. And then I finally I looked at the games themselves, and that's sort of the core of what I'm going to talk about today, although it comes out of the observation. So let's move to theory. Um, I, I'm sort of modifying this great paper that I like a lot by Banks, Bowen, and Wasserman, Multi-Material Bricolage. The title of the paper is A Bard in the Hand. And I forget the subtitle, um, but, but you can find it. Sorry, there's traffic going by. Um, and basically their sort of thesis is that players create RPG characters via multiple materials. They're primarily looking at in-person play. Their paper came out pre-pandemic and they talk about how the like miniatures that people use and the, the character sheets themselves with writing and erasing constitute this sort of recollage, this, this collage of, the, of items, of material items that instantiates the character. So um, I kind of took this and I wanted to adapt it to the online space. And so I, I sort of say, players create RPG play via multiple media. And so I have multimedia recollage. Um, the agency here, of course, is with the players, the Brico Lords, but uh, there is some, some sort of agentic, some sort of deterministic power that the game is applying as well. And that's mostly what I'm gonna talk about today. I wanted to put this bricolage slide first because I'm not proposing an erasure of the human agency, but rather this tension between the players and the game. Why can't I go to my next slide? There we go. Okay, so um, I'm working in a tradition of media ecology and media ecology treats media as environments and media environments are as defined by Christine Nystrom, the interactions of communications, media, technology, technique and processes with human thought, feeling, value, and behavior. So notably, this is not a, a one sort of list of things, right? This is two lists and their interactions. So media environments are these interactions of the first list in yellow with the second list in pink. And that interactive space is uh, really productive. And this is why I like media ecology, even though as I'll talk about on the next slide, it's a little bit problematic at times, um, but, but games are these sort of ecological sites where multiple media are interacting, people are bringing their feelings, thoughts, values, and behaviors to the table. And by looking not just at one or the other, but looking at how they sort of enmesh and interact, uh, we can learn a lot more about games. This is true of online games where the mediation is sort of obvious, but also in-person games. I'm gonna pause and drink some water. <sighs> okay, so. Uh, this is a quote from Ian Bogus, How to Do Things with Video Games, um, and kind of uh, surprising for me, considering the way Bogus is positioned a lot and understood a lot, this is sort of a revisionist critical media ecology. Bogus is often kind of like, well, whatever, we all know, we all know what Ian Bogus is all about. Um, but I was reading this book and I was like, this is actually a really insightful way to think about media ecology, which kind of tends towards over moralizing, right? Media ecology's kind of touchstone scholars are McLuhan and Postman and people who want to say things like 
TV is bad for human society. That's like a gross oversimplification, but that's the kind of things you arrive at when you engage with media ecology a lot. And Bogo says, we need more media entomologists and media archeologists overturning rocks and logs to find and explain the tiny treasures that would otherwise go unseen. So rather than this sort of global media ecology of like games, are they bad? Bogos is in this book is doing this sort of focusing in. He's like, what about this game? What does it do? Or what about this kind of game? What happens? And this kind of tight focus is this kind of media microecology that I uh, undertake and, and I like. So here's what I did with these theories. I watched people play a bunch of games, but I'm gonna talk about D&D 5th edition and Monster of the Week. Both games, when I observed them, were being played online via voice and video chat. They're both a GM game, so there's a, a special player, the game master or the dungeon master, and they both use dice resolution mechanics, although they use them very differently, as I'll get into in a minute. Um, but these games have a lot of similarities. You could find games that are GM-less, you can find games that don't use dice. Um, these games, despite being different, which is going to be my main point, are nonetheless a little bit similar. Even the kind of layout of the, the images of the, the, the covers of the books is similar, which I thought was funny when I grabbed these images. <clears throat> the differences. D&D, &D, uh, with its uh, sort of like roots in war games, following John Peterson's work and the work of other people, simulates action. It wants to say, when you do this, what is the consequence? And it gets to that simulation via numbers. It says, okay, the long sword rolls a D8 and the short sword rolls a D4. I don't actually know anything about D&D &D weapon classes, but you understand it uses numbers to enact these simulations. And thus it has a lot of rules because it wants to be able to simulate a lot of things. Um, it is very computational, drawing on uh, Ian Bellamy's piece in Analog Game Journal about uh, computation. On the other hand, on the right here, Monster of the Week, uh, it does its work by invoking intertextualities. So it, it isn't as interested in simulating or that which it simulates is like a narrative trope. So Monster of the Week is inspired by things like the X-Files and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And its simulations are not of like, okay, when I shoot the monster with a gun, how much damage does it do? It's like, what happens narratively when I shoot the monster with a gun? Um, it is it is trope driven. As I said, it is rules light. So it requires players to draw on shared knowledge of narrative tropes and intertextuality. Here, I'm gonna give some specifics about the two games. So this is a screenshot from the Roll20 that the D&D players were using um, for their anonymity. They're all covered up with little smiley faces, except me, because you all know who I am. Um, so Roll20 is an interface for playing uh, role-playing games online, and it's specifically map-based. You can see we've got a top-down 2D map. Down in the purple room, we've got four little character sprites. Over on the right, this is a, a sort of side view transposition of the top-down map. And the players use this a lot. They move their little sprites around. They cared about how long it would take them to go from place to place, et cetera. They didn't really use this dice interface over here on the right. These are old chats from a previous session. Ooh, I'm a ghost. I'm a non-canonical ghost. Um, I guess a character had died. I asked about this in the interview because it cracked me up. Um, but they did roll a lot of dice. And I'm going to get to the next screenshot. So, this is their Discord interface, as we're all familiar with from the conference here. Um, they are using it to organize, but also to play the game. Uh, so they've got this Avray bot here in the center, and this is like the, the, the central kind of keystone of, of this argument. The Avray bot draws on D&D Beyond. So these, these players were able to make character sheets in a secondary interface called D&D Beyond. They put in the numbers of like, your armor is this, your attack bonus is this, your temporary stats are this. And then via this Avray bot, they can use like programming type languages, right? Line one, comma, call three, colon, expected dollar sign, end, got set. I don't know what that means, but they learned to interface with this bot, which was doing the computational work for them. They didn't have to do the addition, subtraction, the remembering of all the bonuses. D&D Beyond, coupled with Avray, coupled with Discord, brought all that together. Um, they were also using voice and video chat on the left. You can see here, I've blacked out names, uh, but, but everyone except me was on video. And uh, they were using the Groovy bot. Uh, they actually weren't using it this time because they turned it off. They thought it might mess with my audio recording. But the Groovy bot, they told me in interviews, is like a way to, to source YouTube clips of music to, to create ambiance. So they had these two bots and they had all these players and they had all their sheets in D&D Beyond and they were using Roll20 and they had created this sort of bricolage of software to instantiate the play of D&D. Here, I mapped it. Um, the only thing that, that maybe you might be confused about is on the far left, Andrea's keyboard in green. Um, I made this document and then I realized I didn't have time to talk about the keyboard, but one of the players had a, an electronic keyboard in her house that she was playing because she was the bard and she would play songs and it was funny. 
Um, so all this stuff gets parsed through the voice and video chat. Most of it is nested within Discord, but they're also using Roll20 and d Beyond. Okay, so that's, uh, I'm actually gonna drink some water, but we're gonna talk about uh, Monster of the Week at that. So here's Monster of the Week. They played via Zoom. Uh, this is the only screenshot I have because they didn't use multiple interfaces. They use Zoom to talk and to see each other's faces. They use the chat window from Zoom and I'll talk about what they did with that, but all of their dice rolling and reference to rules and stuff happened in person. So the keeper, which is Monster of the Week's uh, word for the dungeon master, had all the books on a physical table in front of him. The other players would just roll 2d6 and report out the results. They didn't like hold them up to verify, thank you showing. And um, they, this gameplay was characterized not by a technical bricolage, but by an intertextual bricolage. So up at the top, we see this long string of letters this is a link to a Google image of a black flag t-shirt. One of the players was describing their character and they said, oh, she's wearing a black flag t-shirt. And one of the players said, I don't know what that means. And so they dropped this Google image in there. So that was like the most high tech this group got. They shared images when a shared cultural reference was not understood. But that tech use was in service of these tropes, these kind of understandings of like, oh, uh, another one said, oh, I have a, a sky pager. And someone said, what's a sky pager? And they said, Boop, there it is in the images. They also in the red circle, we're deploying other texts. We've got the state of Marshmallow Man, we've got Pacific Rim and Kaiju texts. And so these players were creating this shared universe of referentiality, which was prompted by Monster of the Week itself, right? That's a game that already is asking you to draw on shared textuality. And they leaned into that hard. Here is their map. So uh, they have the Zoom, which hosts the voice in the video chat and the text chat function. They had this body of references that they deployed via both of these and they talked into the camera. I didn't get time to talk about this either, but um, they, the, the dungeon master was using uh, Zoom's audio share feature to create some sound effects on occasion. So all of this was happening in the Zoom portal. So let's wrap it up. Why did these games differ? Because they look really different. Um, I will argue that it is in part, I'm not going to say this is like a total, you know, causal argument, but the way that the games worked as games created the space for these different modes of play to emerge and indeed pressured the players and the other media to play in a certain way. Of course, you know, they could have resisted those pressures. They could have said, um, oh, you know, I want to play D and D, but like story mode, light combat, that's, that's possible, but that's not really how D and D wants to be played. And specific to this example, D&D with all its numbers and its computation, which is something I know we'll be talking about later in this panel, um, fits really neatly within online play, within computing and, and digitality. Whereas Monster of the Week drew upon those, those things, it drew upon computation and the, the possibility of the internet to bring people together from across time and space. But uh, that wasn't the primary function. The players were doing their bricolage, not with software, but with referentiality and intertextuality. So uh, I don't wanna conclude by saying that the games were, were it, were the only thing, right? What, uh, what other things I found in the dissertation that I don't have time to talk about here were that other media helped shape the media environment. So whether you play online or offline is obviously a huge thing. Um, players themselves brought their identities to the table. I watched a really fun group play Monster Hearts 2, um, which is like a super queer game. And uh, all these things play into it. But today I'm talking specifically about the game. And so I wanted to highlight that. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. I think that is my conclusion. Here are a lot of images and logos of the things I talked about just to kind of drive the point home. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, yes, virtual round of applause uh, as you. the crowd goes wild. Thank you so much, Craig. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, as someone who has played D&D a lot via D&D Beyond, I'm like, I can't wait to get to the discussion part of this um, to kind of unpack that more. Uh, but first, we have many other talk talks to get to. Um, so next up is uh, Joseph Arnaud. It's Joseph. Where is he? There he is. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. I. Oh, and I'm unmuted now. That's fine. It... Yeah, we... So if you um, would like to get your screen set up and then I can introduce you more, for, more fully. <laughs> Excellent, okay. 
So uh, our next presenter is Joseph Arnaud from Canterbury Christ Church University, uh, and his talk will be on reading Obsidian Portal wikis as literature. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, let's see. So, okay, yeah, Christchurch, Canterbury University. Um, so my research is broadly an autographic, auto-ethnographic analysis of my own creative process. I started out doing a, a master's degree in creative writing at Christchurch while playing a lot of role-playing games. And I talked to my supervisor and we came up with some ideas with um, looking sort of like forward so role playing as a creative writing practice um, and TRPGs as a form of literature, um, one that's constantly on this kind of remediated transformative journey from when the settings are written, the GM plans their world, the players play and onwards. Um, so in autoethnography, you're focusing on your own experience, but working to place it within uh, wider community context and theoretical frameworks. Um, so in this particular section of my research, um, as well as my own um, wiki writing practices, I've been interviewing wiki contributors and analyzing existing wikis um, through different literary approaches. Um, the interviewing is still ongoing. Um, I managed to catch COVID, so I'm behind with that. Um, but uh, the analysis is, is still on the way, and uh, that's primarily what I'd like to talk about today. So, um, so on the on the screen, a lot of terms. If you're familiar with literary analysis, especially as it's applied to role-playing games, these will all be very familiar. If you're not, I thought I'd go through a few of them just to make sure we're all kind of on the same page. Um, so looking at play as a form of literary text, um, you know, is sort of very mainstream approach. It lets us bring a whole host of tools from literary analysis to look at role playing. Um, uh, sort of the key term is uh, Godic literature, which was um, coined by Espin Arseth um, in the 90s, um, which is literature that requires non-trivial effort to go through, that requires an, an extra somatic performance beyond just turning the page. Um, and it can be applied to computer games, it can be applied to role-playing games, it can be applied to Egyptian hieroglyphics, but it's a useful literary model. Um, hypertext and cybertext are both terms that have um, specifically evolved looking at um, com literature in the mode of computers. Um, hypertext, I think we should all be quite familiar with. It just means moving from node to node by reader decision rather than following a set path. Um, cybertext is when the reader is a participant in the text, that there is something extra. Sometimes it's called the cyborg author in that something in the mechanism is contributing to the outcome. So you are not in total control of the reading process. Um, that again, that's looked at computer games and online material, but it's also applied to role-playing games. Um, so when you're sitting down to play your game, and if you look at the game session as a form of text, then it's a cyber text, one that's um, um, that you are authoring, but is author authoring itself through interactions with the other um, players. Um, digital fiction, that's fiction that's written to be written on the written for the computer screen. If you moved it to a different medium, it would lose some of its aesthetic function. Yeah, so it's not a PDF of a written document, but something like a wiki, which if you printed it all out would cease to have its functional form is a good example. And paratext, which um, started out as a literary term, meaning all the things around the text, um, such as chapter structure, page setting and font, and how that shaped how you read the text. It's been broadened out into game studies um, to uh, talk about um, in computer games, for example, things like the menus and other setups in role-playing games. Um, Paratext has also been applied, and it's a concept I think is quite important to understanding the role of wikis as literature. So, um, well, one particular um, theorist, which is quite important to my work, is Jessica Hammer and 
her idea of these stages of authorship because if you've got literature who's the author um and her 2007 work on agency and authority and role-playing games um sort of posited the idea of their serial authors yes none with a sort of overall authority but you have primary authorship which is um your writer writing down his game world designing his game yeah you have secondary authorship um which is your gm preparing for their campaign making their notes planning their stories and you have tertiary authorship which is the idea that when all the players come together and the game is played you are creating something new a new text and i very much like this idea it comes my own thoughts is of a sort of a remediated story world moving along um and each of these authors is creating a different version the version that is the tertiary authors the version that comes out on play is not really the same story world that was in the book it's not the same story world the gm planned it's something new um in terms of where i see wikis and, and other sort of artistic outputs from the playing table i wondered if i put a question mark i'm not sure i like the term but quaternary authorship you know works of literature um or art that um extend with a sort of strong intertextual link to gameplay but are in some sense their own thing they're not an adjunct to the game yeah and a wiki can not always but can be an example of that but um i've been in a game where um the gm friend happened to be in the room and had hysterics after a particularly embarrassing scene and she went off and um drew a picture for it did some art and that art is not really part of our game per se she wasn't a participant but it's a sort of remediation of the game story world not the story world that was in the rule book or it was the game of the witcher so not the story world of the tv or the novels but the story world of our game that's been remediated into something new but it's specifically that particular game session um and in some ways wikis can fulfill that function so what is obsidian portal so obsidian portal is a hosting site for game wikis um it's well over a decade old it's um it's this is business its model is to offer um sort of a prefabricated setup designed specifically to um lay out a game um pre-formatted um there's a free option but freemium you can pay more gives yourself a bigger access um to sort of memory storage for images the ability to do your own cascading style sheets and actually radically change the lookout um and they have um last time i checked 880 odd thousand wikis on their site um i think i might have had an extra zero there but um lots of them are dnd &D wikis lots of them are very small short things but some of them are um you know you could committed works of art i think that stand out by themselves and some of them if you can see that little gaming music thing um are people just reformatting uh, reusing the site for their own purposes so that's not actually about a game it's about someone collating music background music for games and sharing it and all those stands are there so they get updates every time someone adds a new music section to there but most of them are for games um they are you can make a private one most of them are public facing um i did a straw poll um i think if i was going to use it as more evidence in my research i'd, I'd do a more questionnaire based thing of um some authors on their community site and some facebook forums of game designers and got about only 20 responses but all of them said when they write their wikis they're writing with the view that someone who is not a player in their game is going to end up reading yeah so that they're intended to have a life beyond being a tool for playing the game um i chose obsidian portal because i that's where i have used it and that's where i've got a lot of experience there are other wiki sites they're slowly proliferating world anvil for example um there are plenty of people who have personal wikis that's how i started out wiki making are 
our gaming group had a little blank PM wiki we used to keep track of all our games on, but actually paying for that was uh, more expensive in, in a yearly basis than a subscription to Obsidian Portal. So this is a page from one of mine, and it just gives you the kind of format you get. Um, if you were a outside viewer, you wouldn't see a lot of this functionality, such as uh, the settings. You wouldn't see the dashboard. You wouldn't see the secrets. Yeah, you wouldn't necessarily see the forums, the media library, but you would see characters, wiki and adventure log. Um, I've used a little bit of CSS styling. So those are actually active buttons. Um, this is the one I was writing that started this project because I was pouring a lot of effort into writing up an adventure log post as a kind of diegetic camera recording and adjusting the transparency and all of that. And I thought, who am I doing this for? Yeah. Um, you know, who am I doing? Why am I doing this? And, you know, it's a good question. And there are plenty of people, so it seems, who are doing even more than I am and pouring themselves into these as artistic projects. Um, and that why kind of became the question as to I'm starting to investigate. So I basically can conceive of these wikis as sort of three kinds of categories. Yeah. One of them is what they really started out of life as a play aid, a way of organizing your GM notes and your character sheets. Um, yeah. But they also create a framing device for play and I'm going to follow up by showing some example wikis and I will be dropping the links for those in the discord afterwards if you want to see something more than half a snip screenshot uh, from me yeah so um if anyone's read David Jarrah's book at the closer look at the rule books yeah where he talks about how the different elements of an RPG rule book uh, create a frame for play by establishing the mindset and the approach um many of these wikis do likewise um wiki building is actually a, a game almost of itself yeah participatory yeah what um um there's i'll talk about it a little bit um there's often gamified elements created by groups um yeah you're creating an output there are rules which are both the system rules of the actual obsidian portal and there are the rules the group agrees to about who can edit what and when yeah and um you're creating this collaboratively together yeah it's almost like a, a mini game um from the tabletop itself yeah and finally as a work of fiction so if you come to one of these wikis as an outsider without any permissions you can read it yeah um it's a classic hypertext you can move through the different nodes you've got no real control over the outcome yeah I suppose if you were a participant, it would be a cyber text because you're playing and that would eventually affect the game and that would eventually affect what you read. Yeah, even if you're not writing it. But if you're reading it, it's hypertext fiction. And I see those as kind of like the three domains where these wikis lie. So here's an example. Um, this is a wiki called Shadows Over New York. Um, it's for a Dresden Files RPG game. Um, this is actually from, I think, 2013. And they clearly wanted to frame the campaign, or I think it's still going, as a TV series. The whole thing is set up. It's got credits, video. It's got uh, intro video. It's called episodes. Um, they structure a lot of the paratext. Yeah, but all of those things are non-functional. This was way before streaming. It was just the style of game they wanted to play. And by making the wiki like this, um, they helped sort of the players visualize and frame their play as this kind of TV mode, mode of play. Yeah. Um, there's also original fiction from the players on there. Um, all these things like play all episodes, et cetera, are non-functional. When you go through the links, it just links to sort of text adventure logs written up in the style of... Um, tv um so you can see obviously they've taken lots of images from over the internet and that's very common okay so 
as a game. Um, wiki maintenance um, gamified. Um, wiki maintenance is work. So it's actually a sort of crass gamification, player rewards in order to play. Um, in this particular wiki, they're giving hero points if you update your wiki. And wikis as fiction, you have here a wiki where they've written up the adventure in the form of a folk song lyric. Um, another one I've mentioned there, they've written up as newspaper articles and reports. And this one um, is just a written account of play but it's clearly been edited. Um, they play on Discord, um, but they've removed all the ludic elements from the text. So even though it's written GM player, GM player dialogue, they've restructured it. And finally, fan fiction. Um, so if you saw this and you knew Next Generation Trek, you'd know it was Trek and you know it was a Trek story, even if you knew nothing about RPGs or nothing about um, wikis in general. Um, so these are these different approaches um, to how the wikis are presented, and um, it can be different things at different stages of its life. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, I know you had to rush a little bit at the end there, so yes. just, but hopefully yeah. we can um, get more into uh, the meat of this in, in the question and answer period, uh, which is an excellent reminder for any of the panelists here. Um, I know that the uh, it's hard to kind of keep track of the um, Discord while all this is happening, but if folks are having you know lively conversations over there, which I know they are, um, if you have uh, questions for our panelists, this is a good reminder to go ahead and uh, you can start populating the Q&A um, for our conversation in a little bit. Um, and so, um, Joseph, yeah, exactly. Uh, and then we can go ahead and, and move on to our next presenter. Thank you so much again, Joseph. Um, so our next presenter is Jonathan Ray Lee from Cascadia College. And we can go ahead and share that screen. Excellent, thank you. All right, we all set? Yeah, I think so. And then so uh, Jonathan is presenting to us today, Analog Computing and Digital Memory in Time Stories. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm excited too. Yeah, glad to be here. Um, so hi, everybody. Today I have this presentation and I don't really have an argument per se or a thesis, but I do have a provocation. So I'm just going to dive in and we'll see where we go from there. Um, so here's a provocation. Uh, board games exemplify digital and computational play. Um, in fact, I would actually argue in comparison to video games, board games are the paradigmatic medium of digital and computational play, which is not to say that board games aren't analog. We have wonderful work on analog game studies, and I think that talking about the embodied holistic material experience of interacting with these physical systems is wonderful. I love that stuff. Uh, but even while we talk about analog games, we also might notice that there's a lot of really digital elements here. So I define digitality, um, borrowing on definition from Florian Kramer, as um, discrete and countable informational systems. And so when I think about discreteness, I think about dividing things into these separated discrete spaces. When I think about countability, I think about play that's really based on the manipulation of quantifiable values and board games are just all of these things. Um, and again, I don't have time to go through and make a comprehensive theoretical argument about the medium. What I wanna do instead is just to take this provocation as a jumping off point to do an analysis of time stories, just so we can hopefully see in action what it might look like to apply digital paradigms to analyzing this medium that we all know and love. Well, I'm assuming the latter, but. Um, so let's talk a bit about digital memory. So what you're seeing here is absolutely not a game. This is the board for time stories. And if you're into playing games, you might look at this board and say, where can I latch on here? What can I actually play with? Well, pretty much nothing. There's no locations here that you can travel or experience. There's no narrative that you can absorb. There's no strategy that you can perform. This board, which comes in the base game, is effectively a glorified play mat. It's just locations for organizing a whole bunch of stuff for a game that isn't a game, but is a whole series of games. 
These are games. These are time stories and modules. And each module has its own rules, it has its own narrative, it has its own components. And these modules are plugged and played into time stories, which is not a game. As I said, it is a game platform, which means that it's a system for organizing informationally a lot of different games that you can bring to it, such as these and Asylum, which comes in the base set as well. In addition to being a game platform, Time Stories is also a state machine. And so it flags this with a direct comparison to this computational term by using state tokens, which are basically um, manipulable physical variables that you use to track your progress through a story. So you could define a state machine as a machine of recording digital memory in which every player input modifies a variable in order to kind of keep track of an evolving um, state, which allows you to experience the story, not as like a physical experience, but as an informational set. So an example of this is a classic board game like chess is a game where I make moves, physical moves on a physical board. But when people say, hey, I'm going to move A00 to A39, what they're doing is they're basically saying, I'm going to overwrite the location variable of this piece with another um, variable. So it's like I'm modifying informational states every time I make a move in chess. Um, and there's a complicated um, flow of time stories in which if I happen to access this location while owning a particular item, so I check to see if my inventory contains item floor the plunger, then I'm able to unlock promenade E because I've recorded the state machine or the state token on the board, indicating that the game remembers that I've made this particular action. And so from the player's experience perspective, I have this experience of narrative continuity in which there's a causal relationship between my decisions and outcomes, but that's only present because I'm physically manipulating these different kinds of variables. And I just wanted to throw in there that state tokens are um, visual encoding uh, technologies that are really designed to mimic the representational strategy of the QR code, making the player basically um, the reader and processor of these codes as they manipulate the game. Um, and so why do I care that Time Stories is um, this game platform and state machine? Well, it's also because, um, did I lose a slide here? They perform computational play. I lost a slide here. So um, let's talk a little bit about uh, Ian Bogos and um, procedural rhetoric. So um, we've already mentioned Bogos, but there's this argument that um, games make meaning by having players perform procedures that can have rhetorical value. Typically, when we talk about that, we talk about standard gameplay decisions. We talk about, oh, I make a move, I make a strategic decision, I perform an action in the game, and there can be procedural value to that. But there's actually a lot of work in the upkeep and the maintenance of the state machine that might feel like busy work, but is actually, I'm arguing, a big part of the rhetorical project of having a medium um, in which digital and computational actions are part of the play experience. Um, and so to think about that, Time Stories is a narrative game. And so we can talk about how um, analog computing is a process of engaging with this state machine. And so I'm going to argue that players are the analog computers. And I'm X'd out here this, this little graphic in the corner because I do recognize that analog computing is a technical term that has to do with the way that certain kind of computers can process continuous signals. And I don't care about any of that. So if you care about that, that's great. But um, I'm just reframing this term to talk about analog computing as this performed embodied experience of performing computational um, play actions. Um, and so here I put a graphic from the film Hidden Figures, which is referencing this historical um, and really embodied, like the racial politics of this film is based on the fact that computation can absolutely and has historically been embodied. And the first computers or the first use of the word computers referred to these intellectual laborers who are performing computations, you know, kind of by hand. Um, and that's what this film is about. It's pretty cool. Um, so players are analog computers and their intellectual labor is to maintain the state machine that provides the entertainment experience that they are also the consumers of. So 
Um, this is the labor that's involved in making a game work, something that video games would actually automate. And so this labor involves a lot of um, saving and loading and basically taking this big deck of cards, which I've already argued is the game, looking up using these kind of indexing systems, different sets of cards, loading them into the uh, board game here or the game board platform, um, and then experiencing the play. But then once I'm done with this location, I load it back into the deck and pull out another things. And so there's just this real interesting play of moving things in and out of active memory that's involved in maintaining the state machine um, to perform computational play. And this is where that slide ended up, but both of those interesting stuff. <clears throat> so um, when we think about this play experience in terms of time stories, we have to talk about narrative and time stories is a genre that's gonna to relate to interactive fiction. Again, I can't trace the whole history of interactive fiction or all that. Um, so when I play time stories, um, the fact that it's called time story is just a really flagging the fact that it's all about narrativizing this computational play that I've been talking about. And when time stories narrativizes this computational play, it also digitizes narrative. And so what it does is it takes story and it breaks it up into a whole bunch of story elements, which connects a little bit to Greg's point about um, bricolage and the, the constant assembly of something um, in order to experience it. And so there's just a bunch of different digital or quantifiable informational systems here, the item index, the location index, but even things like the state tokens, which are basically binary switches that you flip on and off, the time track, the values on dice. Um, we're pulling all of this together to create a narrative experience that's based on digitality. Um, and in so doing, it also gamifies narrative. And so we have here Bob, who's just yelling in your face and encouraging you not to slow down and experience the story, but to put pressure on yourself to do well. Hopefully you succeed, but you probably won't because the game is designed that you can't actually stumble upon the solution by accident. It's too difficult. What's gonna happen is you're gonna fail. And when you fail, you're gonna be booted back to the beginning because this is a time travel game and you're gonna have to go on and you're gonna have to go back to where you were and say, okay, we're gonna start with a provocation. We're gonna start with a mission and a goal, something that we're trying to accomplish. And in order to accomplish this, we're gonna to have to run through the same tedious nonsense again. We're gonna to have to learn everything that we learned. And it's not gonna be the same experience. It's not gonna be as immersive. What you're doing is you're moving a story from a lively world into something where the architecture is exposed. And now you already understand the structure and now you're doing a speed run and you're just trying to get through this stuff as fast as you can in just the hope that somehow you'll stumble onto something new that might give you the key to what you've been going after this entire time. Um, and so today I wanna to talk about video games and I wanna talk about how video games are a digital and a computational medium for sure, but they stuff all of their digitality and all of their computational play inside this technological black box precisely so that players cannot experience the digitality or the computational nature of their play. Instead, video games create this analog experience of me interacting with this virtual world. Board games, on the other hand, um, and of course they replace here the black box with a white box, but more importantly, they open up the box. And when you open up the box, you get this intricate set of informational variables and the time stories insert is fascinating because it's not just an insert, it's actually a save load system where you can physically record a state in the box that you can load back onto the table and pick up a session. And so you are learning what it looks like to make the narrative system work when you unbox the black box of time stories. And this is really interesting and it makes time stories a great example of how digitality works in games but it also makes time series a terrible example of how digitality works in games because it's so closely tied to the computational technology and the genre of video games that it can get trapped in this comparison. But any board game has a state machine. Um, that's part of the way that it works. And anything that we can talk about with relation to board games can be filtered through a digital paradigm, such as the wonderful race at the table panel that we had yesterday. And in this panel, um, there were these wonderful moments of good analog game studies, close reading. So in particular, um, this uh, image here shows Spirit Island and uh, Brandon Blackburn made this wonderful comparison between the tactility 
of um, holding these hard plastic colonial powers and then contrasted with the tactility of these wooden indigenous people and spirit tokens. And this is a wonderful moment of analog reading, but it's a moment that um, Brandon situated within a larger, what I'm reading as a digital argument about um, the settler deconstruction requiring the binarization of these two different kinds of forces that are materially opposed, but then opposed within the structure of the game itself. And a lot of the other points that were made in this panel had a similar kind of flavor to it. So like, for example, when Mirik said, there's an analog point to be made about the visual resemblance between the map of Africa and the map in Sp Sp at Sky Mines, I think it's called. Um, the idea was not just, oh, we can experience this as this embodied view of race, but also the idea that the broader system was actually connecting um, this point where we could say, well, if we retheme Mombasa, which is this horribly colonial game, we can change the embodied experience. But if the state machine is fundamentally designed to replicate the machinery of state, can we ever escape a colonial frame? I don't know. And this is why this is a provocation. Um, we need to think about how the possibilities of representing these holistic embodied things like race are challenged by the fact that board games might have a moral arc that doesn't, as Martin Luther King Jr. famously said, inherently bend towards justice, but may inherently bend towards binary thinking and the conceptual reductionism of translating everything in our reality into these digital systems so that we can engage with them in this fundamentally computational and gamified way. And that's what I've got. So thank you all for listening. What you got is amazing. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Oh, yeah. uh, well, yes, virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, it was fun. Yes, no, this is, um, my mind is a buzz and I can't wait for our conversation because there's just so many good things happening on this panel. And thank you for the shout out to yesterday's awesome panel. And if you missed that panel, please go ahead and uh, check out the conversation in the Discord about that. Um, and uh, I should also say that soon we will have um, all the talks up on YouTube uh, eventually. Um, so next up, um, we have our last speaker for panel four, uh, who is Doug Stark from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, and Doug will be talking to us today about infrastructural poesis, fluxus games, and creating the conditions of creativity. Hello, thank you for having me. I come to you from an Airbnb in West London. I promise my quarter form decor does not reflect my personality. I'm Doug, a game, media, and film studies scholar completing a PhD in the English program at UNC Chapel Hill. There, I'm working on a dissertation titled Gaming as a Way of Life Towards a Biopolitics of Play. Adjacent, this paper considers the form of individual and collective life that enables fluxus artist George Brecht's radical experiments in analog game design. Conceived in 1964, Brecht's deck a flux game isn't your typical game. It comes with no explicit rules or instructions, simply in some editions, an artist note reading a whole universe interests me. It's 64 cards are of little help in divining an intended structure. The faces depict black and white images, no letters, no numbers, no apparent suits. They recall encyclopedic drawings, scientific diagrams, and sporting illustrations. On the reverse, they all share the same close-up, the hair on the back of Brecht's head. Only manipulating the cards, the deck begins to take shape. Indeed, now encountered behind museum glass or through a computer screen, it's easy to forget that one might have purchased deck at a gallery, in a shop, or had it delivered in a case full of other Fluxus works. Opening up a box alone or with friends, the cards signal themselves as props for play. Consequently, the first time player enacts the protocols one associates with cards, rotating, shuffling, and comparing. Perhaps it's like Snap, Solitaire, some of them look like tarots, house of cards, anyone. In this trial and error process, deck never relinquishes a definitive structure, but that's part of the point. There are no rules for this game, Brecht affirms. When they start to play, the players can make them up as they go along and then unmake them. One time, he says, everyone had to take three pictures from three cards and turn them into a joke, improvising. In visual pun competitions to riffs on Ring of Fire, Brecht recounts that people have made all kinds of games with deck. The opacity of its rules, goals, and images combine with the cultural connotations of cards, 
the eponymous statement that this is a game, and in some instances, Brecht's encouragement to precipitate particularly open play. The players often revise just what that game is in play, renders it worthy of its title. Deck engenders a game in flux, a flux game. The two questions that animate this paper are thus. Where does this weird game that con defies conventional definitions of what a game is come from? And what could we learn about formal innovation from the story of its genesis? The easy answer to this first question is that Brecht's games derive from Fluxus, that international coterie of mostly US-based artists operative in the 1960s and early 70s. Influenced by Marcel Duchamp's Ready Maids, John Cage's Aleatory Aesthetics, and what Alan Kaprow termed the happenings, Fluxus works often involve mass-produced objects, elements of chance and, perfor and, and performance. In doing so, they tend to vitiate against well-worn categories. Turning mass objects into art deconstructs the binary of high and low culture, aleatory methods do center authorial intention, and making quotidian activities into a performance challenges the boundary between art and life. Games, toys, and puzzles, low culture, uncertain, and participatory serve these investments for several Fluxus artists, most famously Yoko Ono's white chess, Takako Saito's smell chess, and the transmogrification of various sports into flux sports. As Fluxus coordinator George Machunas put it in his art amusement manifesto, these co-created, simple, amusing, unpretentious works requiring no skill or countless rehearsals critiqued the exclusive, parasitic, and elite status of institutional art. Much of the wonderful scholarship at the intersection of art history and game studies identifies Fluxus as a compelling group of artists with political motivations to push the horizons of what analog games can be and do. From this perspective, Fluxus either demonstrates that the tendencies of current game-based art have precursors, or for designers, offers formal innovations we can derive aesthetic strategies from. This paper is less concerned with the formal innovations themselves than their historical conditions. To rephrase our opening question, what factors social and material enabled Fluxus's aberrant game design practice that produced weird objects such as deck? To, um, to respond, I focus on Brecht's early work to elaborate first the preoccupations that informed his games, and second, his relationship with Fluxus coordinator George Machunas, who furnished the materials and network that allowed their fruition and distribution. Throughout, I advance the following thesis. Experimental games such as Brecht's take a quasi-autonomous infrastructure as their precondition. Thus, Fluxus attests to how radical innovations in game design result not from some lone genius or art building merely on other art, but rather a nexus of community labor that effectively creates the conditions for creativity. Trained as a chemist, Brecht's work for Pfizer and Pfizer and then Johnson and Johnson throughout his early career from 1951 to 1965 furnished the financial means for his artistic pursuits. His studies in science also led to a particular interest in probability theory. And when night classes introduced him to Jackson Pollock's action art, he was quick to draw connections. Describing himself as a painter in the mid 50s, Brecht brought abstract expressionism together with mathematics, painting using randomly selected Cartesian coordinates and by rolling marbles dipped in ink over the canvas. His 1957 essay, Chance Imagery, elaborates his stance regarding artistic and scientific chance. In art, he explains that there have historically been two types of chance. First, in data and surrealism, a chance where the origin of the images is unknown because it lies in deeper than conscious levels of mind. And second, in Zara, Duchamp, and Pollock's work, chance where images derive from mechanical processes not under the artist's control. Over the next few pages, he traces the shift in the sciences from a cause and effect model to a probabilistic understanding of natural events. Concluding this genealogy with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Brett contends that since at least 1927, chance became an underlying principle of the scientific worldview. Aleatory experiments in art, he suggests, are proper to this paradigm shift. They enable an aesthetic appreciation of, of reality's fundamental indeterminacy. With all this percolating in his mind, in 1959, Brecht attended a course by John Cage in experimental composition at the New School for Social Research. Cage was not so much an influence as, Brecht says, someone that changed him. In particular, Cage's emphasis on choral structures of musical art, where chance derives from the unpredictable interaction of numerous sources, changed Brecht's orientation and painting to performance. 
But whereas Cage's emphasis was sonic, Brecht considered how the same choral principles could be a kind of making music that wouldn't only be for the ears. From this shift emerged Brecht's famous event scores, such as his 1959 Motor Vehicle Sundown event, a piece played by any number of individuals, each of whom receives 22 random cards with simple instructions for operating a vehicle, such as headlights on off one to five times or accelerate motor one to three times. The chance of this piece lies not only in its method, the random selection of cards, but also in the aleatory combination of sound, movement, and lights, cars coming into and out of harmony with one another. But Brecht and several other Fluxus artists reflecting on Cage's class found these experiences to be too dictatorial. Later in his career, Brecht claimed that he wanted maximum freedom for everybody, and that even the notion that his scores were invitations was too strong a term. He preferred his pieces to merely allow events. In the attempt to relinquish authorial control, the scores collected in Waterjam enfolded a further chance dimension, an ambiguity of interpretation. The realization of his piano piece on the left there, for example, depends on the audience. Brecht recounts that one might strike a note in the middle of the piano, push the piano into the center of the room, or only imagine doing something. These less orchestrated, smaller scale prompts expanded the horizon of what an event could be small actions, private thoughts, and even in the case of pieces like drip music, the act of perception itself. As you can see, the event card in the right likely leads to merely observing a dripping tap. To be clear, Brecht did not pursue audience freedom for its own sake. The aesthetic pretension of the open-ended scores adhere with his broader commitment to understanding art itself as a research. The twist is, whereas standard experiments demonstrate known facts, test hypotheses, and generate reproducible results, Brecht sets up experiments without any certain intuition of what is to be found at the bottom or the other side. Ambiguity of interpretation primes the truly unexpected because it introduces another variable that widens the gap between premise and event. Chance becomes interchangeable with choice. We can see how a game such as Deck grows out of Brecht's preoccupation with indeterminacy. Indeed, amid claims from Calois to Castiquian that games are fundamentally uncertain, it's important to emphasize that Brecht favors not an indeterminacy of outcome, but a structural indeterminacy. He simply didn't see the point of games or puzzles with predetermined win states. Why, he asks, would you want to make up a game if you already knew the solution? But Deck isn't just a game without a goal, it's a game without a game. Akin to Brecht's scores, the objects and drawings that comprise Deck are but the possibility of an event, and the event is the game. Moreover, in light of Brecht's aforementioned essay on aleatory art and science, Deck's, Deck reflects an epistemic shift from a classic conception of indeterminacy within set knowable bounds to a quantum conception of indeterminacy, whereby the structure of reality itself is indeterminate. I can say more about this game, but thus far, it's been my intention to offer a glimpse of Brecht's life and thus the social circumstances that midwife his enigmatic approach to game design. Historical transformations in the scientific worldview his means of subsistence as a chemist, and the various classes, conversations, and exhibitions he shared with fellow artists. However, engineering such stimulating environments for life always requires a hidden labor. Connections may be spontaneous, but networks must be maintained. Enter Lithuanian American George Machunas. As with Brecht, Machunas met many future Fluxus figures on an ad hoc basis during the early 60s. In 1961, he opened the AG Gallery on Madison Avenue in New York, which hosted a series of proto-fluxus events, galvanizing relationships formatted for the coterie. A lack of funds meant that the AG was ultimately a short-lived enterprise, and to avoid debt collectors, Machinus moved to Wiesbaden, Germany in late 1961. There, he took a, um, a job as a graphic designer at a US Air Force base. With game history, we never get too far from the military. In 1962, so in September 1962, Machinas organized the first Fluxus Festival, bringing artists together to perform now canonical works. That it was here that Kiggins recounts that the group began to have a sense of itself as Fluxus, attest to the significance of Machinas' labors, creating spaces for exhibition. Machinas' hand in publication would also prove instrumental. Brecht first met Machinas in search of a printer, and in June 1963, he realized Brecht's aforementioned Waterjam event scores, making it the first of the so-called flux kits. Housed in wooden boxes, these flux kits inaugurated a fairly novel means of collating and disseminating work. And to reiterate, Mark Fluxus' shift away from artists performing their scores to a model wherein audience members or consumers became the performers. Upon Machinias' return to New York from Germany in September 1963, 
These flux kits became central to the amalgam of Flux's products, including the Flux Shop, the Flux Mail Order Catalog, a collective newspaper, and the Flux Housing Cooperative. Much like these other facets of what Machunas conceived as a kind of communist corporation, the Flux boxes proved cost ineffective, taking years to produce. His controversial bid to centralize Fluxus would also lead the group to fragment. Nevertheless, without his arguably imprudent endeavors, the games and puzzles series of Flux boxes of which Brett Tadek was a part likely wouldn't have come to fruition. In short, no infrastructure, no games. In conclusion, my purpose has been to demonstrate that the radical art experiments with games we remember Fluxus for, nevertheless take the banal labor of infrastructure as their precondition. What American poet Anne Waldman terms infrastructure poetics. For Waldman, infrastructure poetics not only comprises the often neglected work of finding spaces that host creativity and community, readings, panels, events, and even town meetings, but also shared ethical commitments and ongoing practices that foster a collective's intellectual autonomy from the status quo. As she puts it, protecting the language from euphemism, jingoism, ideology, and sustaining zones of poetic activity and discourse. What is the ethic that Fluxus protects? Despite their heterogeneity, Fluxus artists shared commitments to internationalism, collectivism, egalitarianism, a unity of art and life, humor, and of course, indeterminacy. Indeed, it's difficult to characterize the Fluxus attitude because as the late Owen Smith put it so well, if there is an end or a goal in the Fluxus worldview, both in its expression today and in the past, it is to have no fixed end or goal. In many ways, deck that game without a game, that's alone a goal embodies this ethic. Understanding it in light of its complex historical conditions destabilizes the easy attribution of avant-garde design to idiosyncratic genius or art historical movements, establishing kinship between struggles past and present. Indeed, perhaps we're skeptical of what Mary Demet terms Machunas's corporate imagination proper to post-Fordism, ordaining artists self-directed directed representatives of the Fluxus brand, leveraging inchoate global distribution and production networks, decentering art objects in favor of art events that in many ways presage today's atomized experience economy. Nevertheless, it's precisely Fluxus's attempt to broker autonomy by exploiting what Anna Watkins Fisher calls the play in the system that renders them pertinent to 21st century project projects. Now, when all the old oppositional strategies seem to be co-opted in advance, artists and designers tend to exercise a critical complicity within the systems of valuation they bid to resist. Along these lines, considering the individual and collective life that enables Fluxus games speaks to the still necessary infrastructural labor that makes room for radical play, that creates the conditions for creativity. Thank you. Thank you so much. Excellent, okay. So uh, we have ample time now um, to have a much more thorough discussion, which is lovely. So we have, um, uh, yeah, quite a bit of time. So if, uh, if folks have questions, please feel free to um, put the, that in the Q&A. Um, but just to kind of get the ball started, um, it's, I noticed that honestly, uh, we called this panel remediation and aesthetics, but I think we honestly could have called it something like player labor or uh, the labor of play, because all of you have kind of talked about um, the additional steps that we as players need to do in order to kind of make um, meaning, right? So there's this kind of like assemblage of pieces, um, whether digital or physical, um, to create this meaning through a variety of experimentation. Um, so for example, Greg, I was wondering if you uh, could talk a little bit more about um, the kind of um, uh, the research that you did in terms of watching people play um, because so you gave us those two graphics um, of like the different ways that people were playing. But in terms of you know thinking through um, all the different conversations that have happened today, it, it kind of occurred to me that those might not have 
they may not have gotten to that point of stasis um, immediately and that there could have been generations of experimentation of what was going to work for their specific play styles um, in thinking through all of these different kinds of different labors. So um, Greg, do you wanna talk a little bit more about what you witnessed? Yes, totally, okay, totally. Awesome, and thank you. Sorry, <laughs> no, sorry for not having my video on, I am okay. elsewhere. Um, yeah, so yeah, as there was some chat in the Discord, the group, the D&D &D group specifically, they had kind of worked through, they had started playing together early in lockdown time. And so they had a lot of issues with the tech. And the, when I interviewed the, the players, they, they talked about how, yeah, it was hard for them to work with Roll20 and they didn't like it. And so they went to Avre and the DM specifically was like, yeah, the players are having trouble learning the, the like code language you have to use. So there was definitely an evolution. And, you know, my sort of observational presentation only captures a moment in time. But there's when that's, you know, that's part of why I was happy to get to interview a lot of people for the project because they could tell me like, well, it wasn't always like this. You know, we did this and that and the other thing instead. Um, and in fact, the Zoom group that played Monster of the Week, the DM was a, um, uh, an academic himself. And so he was like, oh yeah, I love Zoom. You know, I use it to teach remotely. And so I had to have a, an account. And so Zoom was just sort of this like available platform for him to, to use comfortably with his players. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, and in the, this day and age, we've kind of all sadly gotten used to the the quirks and infrastructure of Zoom, <laughs> right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, well, I, I won't make a snide comment about Zoom. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, so there's a question um, uh, from Evan Torner asks all the panelists, uh, what is the role of ambiguity in your paper? Uh, Loring Albright shows how players fill in the gaps between different media or platform affordances. Are now contributes how different forms of RPG fiction point to wildly different meanings. Uh, Lee looks to human uh, computation, but could also bring in human interpretation. Uh, and Stark's work on Brecht directly addresses ambiguity as a fundamental building block of play. Uh, does Brecht's work uh, cascade into the other work? In other words, um, and thank you, Evan, for that. Um, I think you would you would kind of focus on this idea of ambiguity um, that I had sort of focused on experimentation or like this you know, the sequencing of things. Um, but yeah, interpretation or different different. Um, traces of of meaning um so if we want to first go uh doug if you would like to answer the last part of evan's question please feel free yeah sure um so this iteration of my like presentation on brecht was more concerned you know with that kind of infrastructural dimension but in my other kind of writing on it um yeah i'm far more concerned with this question of indeterminacy um and also the kinds of different kinds of indeterminacy because i think that typically when we think about um, uncertainty in games. Um, yes, they're uncertain. They have an uncertain kind of like path that they're going to follow as Kaskithian puts it or way back to Kalawad, you know, um, uncertainty of outcome. But I feel like there's a, a different kind of indeterminacy operative when we're thinking about the very structure of the game itself as being indeterminate. And that's what initially compelled me um, about George Brecht's game um, since like I've ended up going in different directions with the flux of stuff. Um, but for him, uh, what is really compelling about his investment in ambiguity and the ambiguity of interpretation is how he understands it to be sort of like coextensive with quantum reality. So he frames some of his work as this like, uh, you know, aesthetic exploration of this newfound scientific worldview, whereby, you know, uh, at least since the, the 1930s, we've started to conceive the world as being fundamentally indeterminate. And for him, um, you know, subjective experience being brought to a game doesn't compromise the objectivity of an experiment because the very kinds of like probabilistic selection that players uh, or kind of participants would bring to the game is coextensive with the probabilistic basis of all things so he has this really interesting theory of game ambiguity that links directly to um the kind of other forms of chance operations that he tries to unfold within play um, and as I'm sure you're aware, Peter McDonald has a wonderful essay that kind of draws this out more extensively that's already published in Analog Game Studies. 
Thank you for that additional plug. I love it. <laughs> uh, do others want to address uh, Evan's question that's in the chat? So uh, 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 Evan had posted it, put it uh, for the panelists to be able to see. Um, additionally, uh, I was just thinking about how this is kind of connecting to our different, you know, like uh, for Joseph, for your work, um, we have, you know, the game module um, and that's one iteration, but then of course, any any of us who have ever played uh, anything, um, we know that that's not how that actually corresponds, right? Like we yeah. like new new iterations, new versions come out of that, you know, kind of platonic ideal of what the game is supposed to be, but then that never actually lives up to that. Yeah, I, I think in some ways, wikis are often the reverse. They are trying to make a platonic ideal from all the, the messiness of gameplay. Um, a lot of the ones, the well-developed ones that are sort of turning their game reports and their accounts of play into fiction and things, they're stripping away a lot of um, the, the social layer, yeah? Um, and they're creating a kind of more idealized representation. I know it's true, I've done it. I have cleaned up some dialogue for a piece with, with the consent of, um, of my fellow players to make a more interesting piece or on, on one of my wikis. Um, you know, it doesn't mention any point that the game broke so they could argue for an hour over pizza um, or that, you know, you turn a, a lucky dice roll or a mistake into part of the narrative when you're writing it up. Um, in some ways, they're very ambiguous documents because while they wikis claim to be a window into play, you've got no evidence that this game actually happened at all beyond the author. You could write a wiki of an entirely fictional game um, and you could put all the art into it and it could just be a creative writing project. So you don't know. Even um, the ones which are trying to give sort of strict play accounts, um, you know, they're cleaned up. Um, you know, they're based on memory or consensus. Um, I mean, that's one of the nice things when you've got lots of different players contributing journals because you actually get different perspectives on the gameplay from what their character is. And rather than an argument at the table about what people meant, it gives them the, that kind of perspective. Um, and, and do you think that cleaning up is for the rhetorical context of the, of the wiki itself in terms of whether it is being used as a player aid versus something else? Or um, why might that be? I think there's, I think there's two. One is, is you know, it's it's an expression of creative writing to the world, and the other, it's the communal memory of the game, in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're trying to sort of bring people into the world, um, you probably you might want to gloss over, you know, an hour repeating Monty Python sketches, and then stick to the to the narrative story. So when people look back on the wiki to sort of refresh their memory of the game, it's the world and the story that's at the forefront. Yeah. And, you know, um, it's sort of, you know, it's lying to yourself, but for it's <laughs> fiction as it's known. Um, yeah. yeah, no, that's, um, so I'm, I'm partly I'm laughing to myself based on um, thinking about the, the wiki itself, but then thinking about Jonathan's talk about time stories, um, which I'm gonna flat out say time stories was not my favorite experience of, of gameplay, um, but partly because uh, as the when I played it, I had friends who did this kind of thing that Joseph that you're talking about, but in the reverse, right? Like very logistically just wrote down, we have to go here and this is where the plunger is and this is what we have to do and don't go down that door. So it was kind of, you know, it's the, the writing down of, of the steps um, that's just the, the ludic actions as opposed to any of the narrative itself, right? Um, and then that kind of sucked out all the fun of it, honestly, for yeah. me, because I was like, well, I don't need this laundry list of 12 steps to do. And then maybe there's one more thing that we're going to do in order to win. Why are we bothering the play? <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of wikis on there, which are just sort of functional tools. And they're like, Fort Bandit's got 50 gold pieces. And um, you don't know what epic stories or fun they had at the table. It's just, a, it's a ref, it's a memory of a different kind that they're looking for. So and you don't know which one you're getting when you're reading the wiki in question. Yeah, the wikis are very interesting to me just in terms of like the kind of, um, uh, I don't, um, I'm trying to think of the right, censorship, that's the word, that's the better use of the word I was trying to think of, like what is being preferenced and censored um, for the sake of the narrative or for the sake of the, the rhetorical context of the, the tool itself. 
Uh, we have another question for, or we have a question for Jay, uh, John, sorry, Jay uh, Ray. Um, what kind of work is the narrative uh, time travel genre specifically for time stories doing in, in the procedurality of the game? Uh, for example, could time stories work as a game if it doesn't have that useful thematic embedded into it? So could time stories have been uh, reskinned, basically? Well, I think any game could work while being rethemed. Um, but I do think that the time travel theme in time stories is really important and it connects it to this legacy of video games. And so a video game scholar, Jesper Jewell in The Art of Failure talks about one of the core pleasures of video games being the, the full loop of the time stories game of you fail, you go back, you learn something, you play it again. And so um, like you're saying, Shelley, it's not fun because um, turning it into this optimization puzzle takes out the narrative. If, that, if that's your source of fun, it's going to get less fun every time. If your source of fun is the fact that you have internalized and learned a system so that you can manipulate it to your advantage, then it becomes actually fun. And so the time stories um, frame narrative is kind of a convenient way of helping players understand that repeating the same thing over and over again is not your traditional narrative immersion, but is this other thing that's based on this kind of um, optimization gameplay. And I think that all board games, to some extent, function this way because I think theme is really important to board games. Um, it enhances that embodied analog experience that we have of participating in a world and all these kinds of things. But there's a lot of different media out there that allow us to participate in imagined worlds in lots of different kinds of ways. Um, and many of them are much more um, even though board games are tactile, they're much more immersive in terms of like a broader sensory experience. Like I can go to the cinema and feel like I'm lost in a world in a way that I really don't feel like I'm inside a board game. They're too small. I always feel like I'm outside the board game looking in. And so there has to be some sort of um, pulling away from the curtain and saying it makes sense why I am performing these computational labor in a way that there's a pleasure in that. I, I really think that, you know, I don't want to knock on themers or anything like that, but I think that you'd have trouble being a gamer if you didn't have any pleasure in computational labor. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, um, Doug, if you want to kind of uh, respond to that, just because you, the, uh, the kinds of games that you're talking about um, are maybe, you know, some might not think of them as games. They're almost these kind of thought experiments. Um, I'm really fascinated by this genre of game that doesn't have rules in that it is emphasizing the making of rules um, by the players themselves, especially since kind of going back to what Jonathan is saying, um, that it, it seems to me then there, there won't ever be that repetition, right? I've never really thought about games in terms of like the amount of repetition that we have to do um, until I kind of played time stories um, for that kind of reason, right? But, but of course, any game that we're playing, the, what are the rules, but simply like the, the, the steps that you need to repeat, right? But that's not what's happening in the games that you're talking about, Doug. Yeah, so, um... Wait, sorry, what, what aspect am I responding to exactly from the previous Whatever you so want, I, was, I apologize, I was, I was, I was that was typing, a rambling I was typing, question. I was in the, in the, no, 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 I got your question. You just said in response to what was just being talked about, I just missed that a little bit. Did you just, uh, I, I was typing something in the in the, in the Discord. What were, you, what were you talking about immediately before? Um, just this idea of uh, the, you know, the games that you're talking about not having rules uh, and a rule set in terms of then therefore there being a lack, I would imagine um, that there would then be a lack of repetition, right? That, how, that I could get this set of cards and I might play it one way, you might play it another way, we might play it um, you know, a uh, hundred times and not necessarily come up with the same rule set, right? Um, or we were revising that rule set. Absolutely, yeah. So and initially what compelled me about um, the Fluxus artists um, when really my research was primarily into the history of video games and I was looking a lot at the intersections between 
um, you know, kind of the military industrial complex and forms of, um, you know, kind of game theory rationality and how that contributed to the sort of organization of space and time within a video game and so on. Um, and Fluxus, you know, uh, Claudia Mesh has a great article that effectively counterposes the video, sorry, the, um, the Fluxus games um, to game theory. Um, whereas game theory is this kind of like, uh, you know, she draws on the language of Deleuze and Guattari and sort of talks of it as a kind of like state philosophy, a kind of uh, very like stratified way of thinking. Whereas the Fluxus games uh, encourage a kind of nomadic thought, um, precisely because you're being kind of like forced to play a game without rules. Now, when I say a game without rules, I, you know, I talked about Brecht at Digger a few weeks ago as part of the game philosophy stream. And I had to begin my talk with a trigger warning um, that, you know, to all the game ontologists in the room that I'd be talking, you know, making this uh, transgression by saying a game without rules. Um, but honestly, just to kind of answer that aspect, um, my disposition towards studying the history of games uh, is to kind of begin with what people are talk calling games uh, and calling play and then kind of go from there and see what that kind of work it's doing for them in that context. So I'm kind of like less interested in adjudicating from the present whether or not something from the past is a game than I am in like seeing, oh, what are you doing with this? Play games? Okay, cool. Let's see how that works for you. Um, and, you know, that's how I've arrived at this point of thinking about Brecht is this unique figure who's, um, you know, experimenting with games as a kind of philosophical tool, really, was my primary initial investment. Um, what's interesting about it, though, in terms of this question of, like, repetition and obviously this desire uh, for these games or these artworks to open on to the spontaneous or the different or the indeterminate, is that when I actually play deck, um, I really just kind of recapitulate tired genres. You know, I start playing Snap. I start playing, um, you know, uh, House of Cards or like Ring of Fire or like whatever. Um, what was really interesting to me about actually playing this is I kind of like illegally downloaded it from the internet or whatever uh, and <laughs> cut all the images out. Um, was the, it actually made me start to think that maybe structure, sorry, the structurelessness um, and this sort of, you know, play, this free play that we so often value in, in, in game studies um, can sometimes not actually be that interesting, um, precisely because it gives over more to me, uh, the boring uh, socially conditioned person who's like, you know, coming to the game with very generic preconceptions about what a game can be. Um, and honestly, like, um, that was one of my takeaways of playing the actual game was to think about how maybe there are more radical opportunities and things that are more tightly designed insofar as they can kind of force me to think differently about things. Whereas these open games uh, sometimes lend themselves to me just, you know, kind of recapitulating the things that I already think. That's really interesting, uh, given, I don't know if you were present yesterday for our talk uh, talks, um, there was a talk on uh, the, uh, it was the, it was the Magic the Gathering panel, uh, for lack of a better phrasing, uh, that was talking about resonances, um, and that we kind of, you know, re re repeat these same uh, tropes and same familiarity, because it's exactly, it's ingrained in us, we kind of, we, this are, these are the things that we're familiar with, so of course, that's what you're going to go for, and yet you're saying that that then is more boring right because it's the things that we already know and so we don't we want that other we want those other experiences we don't want to necessarily repeat the same um uh same old tired tropes that we can think of that's why we look to other people to 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 find new games yeah that's really interesting um yeah, just, just, sorry just as a note in the context of flux specifically there's a lot of like uh, i know i know it in the talk this kind of transition from aleatory methods you know like rolling dice and picking cards um towards this inclusion of ambiguity of interpretation and for some people that kind of uh move too far away from precisely the kind of outside one's ego that, we would, that one could maybe access by the aleatory methods but was not accessed when the uh aleatory relied on ambiguity of interpretation that's interesting Okay, so we have uh, one more question in the Q and A, uh, and I think Joseph, you might be answering it, but I'm just gonna throw it out there for you to answer, anyways. Um, so uh, someone has a question for Joseph. Can we say that in wikis, tabletop RPGs made a sort of full circle of remediation in an attempt to provide a player a feeling of pop cultural authenticity for their games? Many game systems are inspired by pop cultural universe, often having their own wikis, uh, which in turn is often used by um, DMs and players, um, for example, in the case of Star Trek, which was one of your last slides, uh, and then players create their own wiki modeled for a for model after um, wikis of more popular com commercial projects. Um, so, can this act be viewed as an attempt to claim a status of legitimate pop culture project, 
or to play a role of fans of their own games? Lots to unpack there. Thank you oh, so yeah. much for that question. Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so obviously my interviews are still in progress, but um, the concept of realness in terms of making a wiki for, for their own world is, is very much in evidence for the ones I've talked, spoken to so far. And certainly, um, I think there is this idea of, you know, Star Trek, I picked that one as a good example, but there are plenty of others where um, they have um, borrowed elements, you know, to bring that sense of authenticity. Some, um, also, the ones that are sort of derived primary from um, any sort of RPG story worlds um, often use the art in, from the setting as well to give this sense of authenticity. And some um, some companies even license have a specific license that their art can be used for those kind of fan projects. Uh, so I think yes, I think or being a fan of your own work is kind. You know, that's kind of what you know, being an author and a writer is, if you're not going to be a fan of your own work, you shouldn't be doing it. Um, but um, so, yeah, and making it beautiful, making it look um, professional is a big thing. There's a whole community of CSS coders and, and most of the wiki makers aren't great at it. I'm no good at it, but they swap code snippets or discuss ways of doing things to make them look expensive, to make them look professional even if behind the scenes they've just well i again for my own example bash together a few scripts together to give it the feel of um the original you know so i think there is a pursuit of this uh sort of numinous of, of respectability authenticity realness um in in in, in not all but in, in many especially the ones where they've lavished clearly lavished considerable attention above and beyond um sort of an adjunct for gameplay yeah and what's interesting about that or as you're talking i'm just thinking um so I'm, I'm fascinated by this uh collaborative aspect in making the wikis that might go beyond just like oh i have my gaming group and so i'm not necessarily talking to these people about how to make the wiki but then talking to other people who are playing other games and taking their code hopefully yeah. with you know permission um or maybe it's open license whatever um and utilizing that in order to then recreate my thing so, so there's, a, there's a lot of you know quite a few of them will have little attribution boxes about where they've got the code from uh, mm -hmm. a few of people have actually published wikis which are nothing but correct collections of example code mm -hmm. um and um yeah and they said there's an an active not very big but an active community sort of working and developing the code not about what game they're playing but you know what effect can we regenerate and it's quite quite interesting yeah no it absolutely especially like as a as a teacher just like the pedagogical aspect of it is though i can go to this in order to learn how to code is is fascinating to me yeah i mean i one of my wikis got a they have a campaign of the month where they every month they look for a new wiki that's you know someone's put a lot of effort in and they do a little in, mini interview with the author um, they've been going for you know well over a decade so there are a lot of them now and my turn came around and I was saying but I didn't really do anything I just bashed it looks nice but that's a combination of convincing one of my players to do three days of data entry and um, me harvesting a load of code and said that's fine that's what most of these are yeah. you know it's supposed to be a collaborative endeavor in that regard yeah and again, uh, going back to the idea of the labor involved in all of this in order to make to make meaning out of these things. Um, we are just about out of time. Greg, I have one very silly question for you that I could probably ask you in the Discord, but I'm just going to ask you just because I'm dying to know. Um, as, as you were playing on um, all of the digital platforms, um, you, you showcased you know, the, the images of uh, the D and D Beyond uh, platform that showed you how you can roll the dice, um, and then talked about the Discord bots um, or add-ons that you could also do that. Did any of your players do the mixing of digital and analog um, the way I do when I play on D and D Beyond, and I totally ignore that and have my pretty shiny dice and roll them on my table? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Most of the online sessions I observed, the players were pretty firmly in the the digital interface um but the monster of the week game was one outlier where they you know they weren't using a digital platform and there was one interviewee 
the group, it was a different group than the one I talked about here, playing D&D fifth edition. And most of the players were using a digital dice roller. And I interviewed this person and they were like, no, I need to roll the dice on the table. It doesn't feel right without that. So there was a little, a little hint of that coming in because that's very much my, uh, my personal position as well. Um, so yeah, I'm yeah. glad to hear that to sort of wrap us up with another ambiguity of the, the digital analog. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm always fascinated by that. And I'm glad that I'm not alone in, in I have many, many, ma many sets of dice. And even when we play digitally, I just can't not use them. Um, I need that tactileness. Okay, so that's me nerding out. But that's all right. I was really curious about that, Greg, um, just to just to know. Um, so thank you all for coming um, to panel four, uh, remediation and aesthetics, and one last round of applause for all of our panelists who were utterly amazing. Um, and of course, the conversation can continue in the Discord as it has been going on. Um, and as we mentioned yesterday, um, we at Generation Analog are very committed to you being a human and taking breaks because sitting here for many, many hours is a lot. So please uh, do enjoy your half hour break. Um, and if you would like to uh, come back at noon uh, Eastern time um, for panel five, which is on participation and pedagogy. Thank you all so much. <laughs>